Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Burns. I'm an educational audiologist, and I work with Alberta Education, Low Incidence Team in the School and Community Support Branch. Just a reminder, and I'm sure Elena's already mentioned this, to have your camera and microphone off at this time. And if you have any questions for Dr. Johnson, can you place them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen section? And we will, uh, if time permits, we'll ask Dr. Uh, Johnson these, this, um, these questions. Today we have the privilege um, to have Dr. Cheryl DeConde Johnson with us. She is presently residing in sunny Tucson, Arizona, and we're not going to talk about the weather here. Cheryl's not only well-known in the field of the deaf and hard of hearing, but her influence in our practice has and will continue to affect our work for years to come. Her contributions span a number of disciplines, including educational audiology, teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, speech language pathology. Her work in the area of self-esteem, self-advocacy, educational audiology, and management issues in the school environment as it relates to children who are deaf and hard of hearing has guided, guided many of us over the years. Today, Cheryl will be speaking about single-sided deafness and the implications for self-esteem and self-advocacy. With this very short introduction, I'm handing this over to Cheryl. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. That was way too kind. And um, I just appreciate the opportunity to chat with all of you today and hopefully we'll have some good discussions. This is um, a topic that became um, more apparent to me in terms of our need to build much better awareness about the impact of single-sided deafness and, and really unilateral hearing loss um, with the children that we see. And it's as I'm sure you all know, uh, any of our kids who seem to have great speech and talk well and um, respond when people talk to them, they may not totally understand, but they respond. Um, they present a different picture to um, our educators who aren't familiar with deaf and hard of hearing children. And so they are often um, under unreasonable expectations for their participation and their behavior is often attributed to other things than their hearing loss. And so that's really kind of the focus of this presentation today. Um, I'm going to move through it um, at a reasonable speed. And again, please do keep your questions. I'm anxious to have some discussion uh, when we wrap up. So let's go to the first slide. Second slide, actually. And um, I wanted to just start to sort of set the stage about how important this whole idea of um, self-identity, self-esteem leading into self-determination, self-advocacy. And I think for me, what was really important is that I've seen, we've done so much work to have students become better self-advocates for their needs. And oftentimes I felt like we were expecting children to advocate for themselves when they really didn't um, understand their own hearing loss or how to advocate or the importance of it because I felt like we had jumped over some steps that perhaps needed to occur first before we could expect kids to um, successfully advocate for themselves. So this little roadmap is sort of some steps I see that are really important and obviously the, the path could be a bit different for different children. but. Um, Promoting the development of identity and self-esteem is absolutely critical from the very beginning. This is something that begins at birth through early childhood with parents and their children and then um, continues as those children develop. Um, helping them understand their hearing loss um, as educators, deaf educators and audiologists, I think we understand or recognize how important that is. But I have to say, I teach the audiology course for our master's degree program at the University of Arizona, and I always have, oh, about a third of my class are deaf or hard of hearing themselves. And I can't tell you, I would say maybe 10% really understand their hearing loss. So as they take my course, oftentimes that's the first time they really understand an audiogram its implications on speech understanding, listening and noise, all things that they've experienced but really haven't had the background understanding to sort of connect the dots. And so, again, I, I, we can't start too early and emphasize how important this is um, for our students and children as they grow up. 
um, promoting choice making. Um, I remember back when um, I was working in the schools and colored hearing aids first came out and I was a huge proponent of that as well as the colored ear molds and I remember laying out the old phonic ear keychain with the different colors and offering a student to pick their color and the parent sitting next to me is hyperventilating because oh my gosh why would you ever have a bright color of a hearing aid um, but it goes back to having a voice and a choice for children in the decisions that we make about them and it's more than just picking hearing aids but all kinds of communication accommodations um, encouraging children to problem solve so that they learn um, the implications of the decisions that they make um, developing understanding the process of goal setting and planning so that um, they have goals, particularly in the area of um, communication and interacting with their peers, how they may go about that, planning, trying, evaluating how it goes, making changes based on um, what their results were. Um, continuing to explore all of these different possibilities for um, opportunities that they can participate in in school, um, knowing that perhaps they won't get the lead role in a play but by exploring the possibilities they understand what it takes to be in that particular position um, again looking at the outcomes of the choices that they have problem solving um, what they might have done differently promoting that reasonable risk taking so trying things that might not seem um, in their sphere of what they think they can do but maybe they can and they won't know that without taking the risk. So these, and I'm sure there's many other steps that we would think about that really would be better off um, discussed and developed before we expect students to start out on that path of really being able to um, advocate for themselves. So in the end, the self-determination skills are important because it helps them really be more competent about managing the decisions that they make and the consequences um, of their actions. Slide. So I'll start with some takeaways um, for this presentation, just in case you get bored and want to get to the end first, we'll start right there. Uh, first of all, just a quick um, distinguishing between unilateral and single-sided deafness. Unilateral hearing loss being um, any hearing level that affects one ear and single-sided deafness being a subset of that where there's deafness in one ear. Um, so I think that um, generally hearing loss is um, invisible, we know that, but the, that's behaviorally insidious. That identity as a person is paramount to their well-being, but identify, identity as a person with hearing loss, particularly with unilateral or single-sided deafness, is often unclear because of um, they have the ability in many situations to listen and respond effectively, but other times they don't. And so it really requires support and counseling to help sort out when it works and when it doesn't work. Every child is different, but all kids are at risk for the same problem as a child with bilateral hearing loss. And when I say every child, I say every child with um, unilateral or single-sided deafness. We can't assume that these children are fully accessing their environment, communication, or learning, even with the best hearing technology, or that when they do access, they are able to understand and process everything that they hear. Uh, and there are often a variety of interacting variables, meaning that there could be other um, deficiencies going on with a child in addition to the hearing loss but it's critical because the sensory impairment is the first thing that occurs and and so we have to give precedence in that area to thoroughly evaluate and, and investigate the role the sensory impairment plays and how that relates to the child's behavior and learning abilities and it has to be done by quality qualified personnel who can recognize um, how these are tied together and how they may not be um, part of each other's. So, and again, audiologists are at the beginning of this journey and can have a significant impact on the outcomes. 
sorry. I'm going to start about talking about um, this case study. Um, I was uh, involved as an expert witness um, with this case, and um, that really was, was my involvement. Um, as you'll find out, we ended up settling out of court, so I never had to make a test provide testimony uh, for a judge, but in the process provided a lot of guidance to the attorney that was representing um, this particular student um, and parents. So here's Kevin, and this is not his real name, uh, but he was the other guy in that first picture. I forgot we skipped right by the first slide, but Kevin is the young man in the picture, and the other little girl is Allie, and Allie's mother um, heads up the Microtia Atresia support group. Um, that some of your families might be part of. So back to Kevin. Um, early history. So he um, is now 13. He's lived with his grandparents since he was four. He was adopted by them at six along with his younger sister. And he refers to them now as his mother and father. Uh, the prenatal birth and developmental history is mostly unknown except that we know that his mother was reported to have bipolar disorder and a history of drug use. He was removed from the home um, by grandparents because she was not able to care um, for, for her, her daughter. This was her daughter, so she was removed to the care of her parents, the children's grandparents. Uh, when he arrived at four, he attended a community preschool, and then at school entry for kindergarten, there was no reported significance in learning or any um, medical issues. We can go to the next slide. So in um, kindergarten, he passed his hearing screening. Um, the teacher, however, noted in her notes about the progress he was making that he had difficulties with listening comprehension and talked these over with um, the grandmother, the mother now. And during the summer, she did consult a pediatrician. Um, they diagnosed um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and the doctor referred to an ENT, and then the ENT had the audiologist assess him, and that was the point where the diagnosis of single-sided deafness in his right ear occurred. Slide. In first grade, um, then, his mother referred him for special education, and I am um, going to do my best to explain um, our terms in the U.S. Many of you may be familiar with them, and in many time familiar with them. And many times, there's very much parallel language um, in uh, Canada. So I, I'm not specifically sure about Alberta, but assume that um, as I explain these, there will be a corollary type of of uh, regulation or um, team that's available there for you. So the um, where this student resided, they called it a multidisciplinary educational team that comes together to do the assessment once the referral is made. Um, they did assessments in the areas of speech language, um, occupational therapy, in part because of the ADHD, and then they used the audiologists uh, from the ENT, that evaluation to cover um, the audiology part of it. So their findings, again, per the audiology report, that he had single-sided deafness and 100% speech discrimination in um, his other ear. The receptive language was low average. Um, his expressive language showed a moderate delay. Um, they found that intellectually he was functioning fine and that his pre-academic um, skills and academic skills were estimated to be in the average range. In the social emotional area, there were concerns related to his hyperactivity. They felt there was some conduct problems. They call it atypicality. He was a bit withdrawn, had some attention issues. Um, they did a functional behavioral analysis and indicated that his behavior was attention seeking. Um, So at his um, eligibility meeting, and again, in the U.S., we have a, a meeting that first sees if the students meet eligibility for special education, followed by a meeting that actually designs um, the um, individual educational program that the child will receive. 
So they um, identified his primary disability as other health impaired based on the ADHD and his secondary disability is speech and language impaired. Neither the district audiologist or the teacher of the deaf or hard of hearing was invited to be present or part of the assessment or the um, eligibility or IEP meetings. Mom told the IEP team um, that he's easily frustrated at home, he can be bossy, he lacks social skills, that he's having problems interacting with other children, he tends to give up easily when learning something new and has temper tantrums. And um, in the notes, the SLP responded to her saying that, well, lots of kids that age are like Kevin. So I hope little red flags are going up in your minds. So again, at the IEP, there was no recognition of his hearing loss and there was, uh, or the implications of his hearing loss and no accommodations were made to address his hearing loss. Now we're on into second grade. Uh, just before starting second grade, he did have surgery for a bone anchored hearing instrument, specifically Pontos, uh, a Ponto. Um, at the fall IEP review, excuse me, that's um, at the fall IEP review, they um, determined that um, he would continue. They indicated that he had a hearing aid, but there was again no audiologist or teacher of the deaf involved and no adjustments were made based on the fact that he had um, had this device implanted, although recognized that the processor was not activated until March. So there was quite um, a distance between its surgery and then actually um, activation. But again, they mentioned that it occurred, but made no um, changes to his IEP as a result. Next year, he's in third grade. Again, no changes. They felt like he met standards on state tests and was um, making good progress. At the beginning of um, fourth grade, it, we have a three-year eligibility um, re-evaluation. Um, so they, make they look and really see if the student is still eligible for special education. They did not complete any additional testing, but went ahead and, and staffed him out of special education because the goals on the IP had been met and they declared that he was now a model student. The multidisciplinary education team noted that um, the ADHD disability was still present, but did not feel it was significant enough to require specially designed instruction, which is the critical component that a student needs to be eligible for special education. Uh, his grades um, at that time were mostly B's and C's, but he did have a D in math and actually an F in his fourth quarter. And on the state tests, he was minimally proficient, minimally proficient in math and partially proficient in English language arts. So even though he was staffed out, there's still some questions about um, his school performance. Fifth grade, again, now he's not receiving any special services. Um, his grades in math were a C. Quarter three, he had a D. Uh, his reading was C minus, and he again had a D in quarter two. So grades are done um, as a semester reporting, but they also have interim reports for quarters. So that's why you see that. Um, and he was partially proficient on all of his state tests. Now we're coming to sixth grade. And in the fall, we began to see reports of discipline issues. There were three in one month centered around inappropriate language. He threw an object at a student and ended up with in-school suspension. At this time, his mom requested that there be another special education evaluation. Again, noting the decline in grades, behavior issues, and concerns with his hearing. So the multidisciplinary educational team, again, did not include the educational audiologist or teacher of the deaf. But noted in the reports, he fails his hearing screening annually. That's interesting, since he has a device. 
anyway, um, they stated on the IEP that he, um, his current dis difficulties are not primarily the result of the adverse impact of deafness in the right ear. And they determined that additional assessments were needed to look at eligibility again. So they wanted to look at his general intelligence, academics, communication, social emotional functioning, motor sensory, and they did another functional behavioral analysis because of his um, behavior. At the eligibility meeting, they again determined that his eligibility would be other health impaired, um, saying that most of his behaviors were a result of his ADHD. Um, again, they made the statement that his difficulties were not primarily the result of the adverse impact of deafness in the right ear. At this point, mom asked for evaluations related to audiology and hearing impairment and that the eligibility include hearing impairment. And the school district denied that request. And she asked for an independent educational evaluation at school expense. And uh, the district denied that because they didn't, had not conducted their own evaluations in those areas. And the way it works in the U.S. is you can't get an independent evaluation unless the district has already done their evaluation so that there's something to compare to. So they did grant that um, independent educational evaluation for um, psychoeducational assessment which they had done in the OT occupational therapy evaluation, which they had done. So at that point, mom filed a due process complaint, meaning that she um, did not support the recommendations the school were making and she um, refused to sign um, the paperwork. And so um, once the IEP meeting was scheduled. So remember that first meeting there was eligibility. The next meeting is to develop the IEP. She told the school that she's bringing her attorney. And at that point, the district decided to invite the educational audiologist to attend. So at the IEP meeting, which continued, um, even though mom had not given permi um, permission for, um, or she filed the complaint, but I guess with the complaint, because things were in process, they were able to continue um, with their meetings. And so, you know, again, this is a lot of um, what has been stated already. The psychologist talked about his difficulties because of the ADHD. Um, it's interesting that the symptoms included difficulties with focus and attention, poor listening skills, being in trouble for not paying attention, and that he's extremely self-conscious about his hearing aid implant, um, which seemed to also impact his mood. ADOS um, is an autism diagnostic observation schedule evaluation, and they looked at that, um, but there was no evidence of him being on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, speech language pathologists thought that he needed, um, that he had the ability to understand and use language and a social language appropriately, but might need some, some guidance um, at times. And there was um, no real concerns on the occupational therapy summary. The audiologist um, at the IEP meeting did not do any additional assessment. And so simply just noted that um, based on his last evaluation with the ENT's audiologist, documented that he had right single-sided deafness, that he wore a ponto bone anchored hearing aid on the right side, and that his last evaluation demonstrated um, excellent aided benefit in quiet situations. Another thing to note. Um, so what they agreed on in terms of needs is that they could increase his communication ability by recommending um, some kind of hearing assistive technology, um, either a classroom or personal FM amplification device. So this is the first time that that's been suggested for him. They did not pursue special considerations, and this is a unique part of our IEPs in the U.S. for children who have um, deafness, deaf or hard of hearing, behavior issues, 
or are blind visually impaired. And there's something called special considerations for each one of these populations. And for the child who's deaf or hard of hearing, it allows us to more deeply investigate um, opportunities for direct communication with peers in the language mode and communication mode and, and some other areas. But because he was not identified as deaf or hard of hearing on the IEP, he did not have access to special considerations because you have to have that disability label in order to get special, special considerations um, in the area. So um, I'm not going to read these goals, but the goals that they offered in the social emotional area really um, put in my mind a lot of onus back on Kevin to fix himself rather than the school to try to accommodate um, and support through development some of the concerns and social uh, skill areas that he was having in the behavior outbreaks. So, um, you know, this is our typical IEP lingo where we're very critical about writing SMART goals. Um, and they, you know, they did, you know, the last one about if he becomes upset, frustrated, or angry, he would choose to use some kind of coping strategy, deep breathing, um, a fidget, whatever. But again, what I see here is not the ability to look at Kevin and really talk through why he's frustrated, but sort of to put a band-aid on the frustrations and problems that he's having with these kinds of recommendations. In terms of the uh, accommodations for him, they did recommend finally preferential seating, um, making certain that he understands directions and um, if necessary, provide close captioning for any kind of movie medias, uh, media that would be part of his classroom instructions. So just a few accommodations for him. And the services, um, were much more extensive than in the past that they offered. Um, but again, if you look at audiology, all they're offering is an annual audiogram that could be provided by the district audiologist or by the parent's audiologist um, paid for by his insurance. Um, the FM system would be something that could be supported by the audiologist, but only at an hour um, per semester, which when you're orienting to new equipment, um, that's not a whole lot of time if we want to support the school personnel also in, in its use. But again, to me, most of these services um, are not really dealing with the self-esteem and the other underlying issues that this young man has been experiencing for a number of years. So, um, why did it go to due process? And this is, I, I came in, um, in the at the IEP meeting involvement stage and at that point I was primarily guiding the attorney in what to look for what to ask those kinds of things but to me these are kind of the steps about what went wrong one um, they did not rescreen his hearing in kindergarten when the teacher expressed a concern and I know that oftentimes if you have volunteers conducting your hearing screening program or even a trained technician kids get used to that routine of raising their hand and we could overlook um, a single-sided deafness situation, although I think it's um, relatively uncommon. But nonetheless, if the kindergarten teacher expressed concerns even in light of him passing his screening, the district I think should have um, gone back and did a rescreen. We have a law that in the U.S. that um, schools are required to ensure all children with disabilities are identified, located, and evaluated. So it would be there that that would be one law that um, went, that was not observed. Um, this assessment, they did not conduct the assessment according to the requirements of our federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, because they did not do a full evaluation in all areas of suspected disability, including some functional performance um, assessments, but again, they didn't recognize that the hearing loss was part of the disability. But in the end, that failure to conduct those assessments is a denial of that child's free and appropriate public education. So as part of all of that, they didn't recognize the possible implications of single-sided deafness. 
they didn't identify um, the hearing impairment as a disability category, didn't address the special factors, and they also didn't offer um, a 504 plan once he was um, staffed out of special education. In the U.S., a 504 plan simply provides people with disabilities access accommodations. It does not provide specialized instruction. It's critical that even if you don't have instructional needs, you need to have access and access to your learning environment or what's going to happen is you're going to develop more problems that will require special education. So um, through the um, due process, the attorney went ahead and um, brought in myself and again a speech language pathologist um, outside of the school to do these independent evaluations. And um, I was so lucky to get hooked up with this marvelous speech language pathologist. Um, I can't say enough about um, how thorough she was and how much she understood the implications of um, hearing impairment on this young man and but in general on the ability to function in school and the impact for language. So first test that she gave um, was a clinical um, evaluation of language function, the self. And what she found is there was a significant difference in understanding language and then how he was able to express himself. And also um, the difference between semantic knowledge and the ability to apply memory to language tasks. And you can see here the percentile ranks if you just look at those in language memory is very low. Um, expressive language um, is quite low. So again, in summary, um, it was hard for him to deal with some of these more higher level metalinguistic skills that are needed to um, really interpret and understand complex language. And so she said we would expect him to have processing problems and some other language is issues that would impact um, his academic performance. In the test environment, she noticed some struggles um, that he would get frustrated and would bang the chin, his chin on the table and actually start crying um, when he was really, really struggling. Um, his productions were characterized by false starts, stopping, restarting, and very long pauses. So he needed extra time to formulate answers and um, would make many self-corrections even after an item had passed. So he was still mulling over um, what he had said and wanting to make corrections. So this is that processing time that we talk about is so important. And her comment was, in a classroom, if Kevin is rethinking things, the rest of the class is moving, in, moving ahead and he is likely to be frequently lost throughout his school day. Overall, Kevin's scores may appear to be better than his actual functioning, as a great deal of effort and self-correction was noted. And in a rapidly paced classroom, he does not have the luxury of time that the testing environment affords. Next assessment was a functional listening evaluation. And she was able to um, perform this. And um, what's interesting to note here is the difference in his scores when we use common phrases, which are simple phrases like the bus is here, it's time to go, um, things that would be very simple for um, a person with single sided deafness to repeat because there's so much context in those phrases. And if you look at the scores, you can see that all of them um, are in the 90% range. So then she switched to nonsense phrases, and this really looks at how he understands a word without any context. And so here you can see how his scores really changed and this challenged him. And if you look at the most difficult of the uh, conditions, which is the distance, noise, and either auditory and visual, or no auditory input, so no speech reading, you can see how his scores of 50% correct and 30% correct really show how he struggles when those situations occur in his communication. And again, they're very frequent. There's noise in classrooms, the teachers talk to you at a distance, and oftentimes they're not facing you when they speak. Um, I interviewed him and um, 
did the classroom participation questionnaire. And this is looking at his ability to um, understand the teacher, other students in the classroom, and then how he feels about that, both from a positive and negative perspective. So you can see in the slide, um, the yellow boxes are his scores, it's rating. The box off to the side at the top 3.25 would be the lower range of um, the norm for this child. So his scores, um, 2.75, so below average, 2.5 for understanding students, again, well below um, the cutoff score. How he feels about it, 1.25, again, well below. He does not feel good at all about communication with other children. And then the negative effect um, is levels of frustration and, and being upset and unhappy in discussions also were significant. Um, he had a much greater incident of incidence of those. So clearly, um, when we talk to him about how he functions in his classroom environment, there's lots of issues that are impacting how those um, how he participates and how that communication goes. So some of the implications of um, this particular case study that I think were really important and included in my report were um, just, first of all, his identity as a person. This child had a rough beginning um, with his mother, um, and maybe there's some feelings of rejection, um, although I think the adoption process with his uh, grandparents is, was very smooth and everything I observed with his relationship with his grandmother, I didn't observe him with his grandfather. Um, were very positive um, and very warm and loving. So um, I think he's in a good environment, but you know, you just wonder about his general identity. And then you add on to that a uh, person with hearing loss. And my, my sense with this is if we deny that all of the issues that he's experiencing are not associated with the hearing loss, then how does he think that hearing loss plays out in who he is as a person. And if the school continues to not acknowledge how that might impact him, um, I think that's very hard on a student um, or a person. And so I, I think in this case, and you know, we found later on too through counseling that you know, he thought that that was just something that he had that couldn't be dealt with and that there was all these other problems, yet the other problems in many ways were associated with um, the hearing loss and the lack of ability to really um, work on that early on um, in his life. Um, and then when all of the accommodations and support were taken away when he was removed from special education and the fact that he was moving on into um, adolescence, his behavior and school performance really um, spiraled. So the school never recognizing his hearing loss was a factor and the fact that they really put um, the focus on his behavior I think was really misplaced uh, in the support for his challenges. And then overall obviously his rights um, were denied. So again the SLP made a great summary statement in her report. An unawareness of the effects that single-sided deafness can have on a child's academic performance can lead to a re reactive or failure-based approach towards intervention. By recognizing the significant effect of Kevin's hearing loss, supported intervention efforts can be proactive and can lead to successful academic and social functioning. So to tell you what happened as a result of the due process hearing, um, we never made it to court. Um, in a fairly arduous um, mediation settlement, um, the attorney prevailed on behalf of Kevin. They had already placed him in a private school that following fall as a seventh grader because the mother couldn't, she just couldn't ba uh, face having him go back to his other classroom even though the school offered him to go to a different school. Um, the school that he went to was a um, charter school for children with learning disabilities. And so it was quite interesting because there were three other students there that had hearing loss in this category of what we 
kind of called minimal mild unilateral single-sided deafness. Um, so he found some other students that had similar listening and communication needs that he had. Um, the district had to pay big time for services. So they're paying for his private school placement until he exits the education system. So from seventh grade on, they're paying for um, an FM system for him to use at that school. They're paying for um, counseling services. It turns out the counselor at this school for kids with learning disabilities has a husband who has single-sided deafness. What more could we ask for other than maybe the counselor themselves? So in the end, the placement um, has served him well and he um, struggles still, but through counseling is making um, some really good progress. So again, just reflecting on this case, I, I keep going back to identity and social emotional development and how those considerations are just paramount to how any child functions. And that, um, you know, we've got to have a handle on identity and support um, for developing that identity that then crosses over into how kids relate with other kids and how they develop social communication skills. And again, the fact that his hearing status was not never recognized or factored into how he functioned, I think was a major issue. Um, again, the counseling that he's receiving now and ongoing support is serving him well. And he has some peer opportunities to share experiences with um, at his particular um, charter school that he's at. Looking at um, single-sided deafness, I think um, one of the things that we could look at, and this is unilateral hearing loss as well, is maybe kind of a risk factor approach. Um, there's those external factors, the amplification that's chosen and the quali uh, qualifications of the personnel that um, serve these students. But I think some of those other factors, the internal ones looking at age of identification, when there was diagnosis, was it a progressive hearing loss? Um, how, how appropriate was the assessment and the intervention? What's the family situation? What was the early development um, challenges or birth history that were there? The more of these issues that enter in, I think the more risk factors we have and the more these children are at risk for having significant school problems. And so that may be one approach as we're looking at this population of children is to make sure that we have looked at all of these internal factors and then looked at whatever external support um, they're being provided. And getting back to the social emotional component, um, it's important that somehow in our practices we incorporate um, identity, um, self-determination and self-advocacy and ask students, you know, what do you think your strengths are? What are your challenges? And maybe you si start outside of the realm of communication and anything associated with hearing loss, but, you know, get to know what's underneath the children that we're serving. Dig a little deeper, um, you know, ask them about their barriers and, and if they need help or what they're doing to overcome any kinds of communication challenges. Um, and ask them how they interact with others as well. So just some, some conversation that we can have to understand some of the underlying um, precepts of how these children function that I think are easy to overlook in our routine audiology assessments. Using a tool like the, the um, classroom participation questionnaire, um, some of the tools that um, we have, the other tools that we have available to us, I think are good door openers to use so that the children respond or the students respond to questions and we can say, hmm, let's talk about this a little bit more. You, you noted that um, you struggle when other children are talking in the classroom. Um, let's talk about what you might do to help improve that particular situation. I do want to recommend a guidance document that's on the Educational Audiology Association website. Um, because these um, advocacy statements and guidance documents are written for school administrators, parents, teachers, um, not specifically for audiologists, um, we did pull all of these categories together because we felt that from their perspective, um, 
they kind of have similar um, behaviors and implications, even though we need that, we know that the accommodations and interventions may be um, very different. So we've just called this group MUSD, Minimal Mild Unilateral Hearing Loss and Single-Sided Deafness, to have some kind of an acronym. And so the document provides a bit of an introduction and overview, um, what we would recommend in terms of educational audiology oriented evaluations. So things that look much um, greater at functional assessments, um, how children function in their school environments. I think back to the audiologist of Kevin who diagnosed the hearing loss and only did speech discrimination and quiet and how we could expand on our evaluations to really look at listening in noise. In the sound booth, we can simulate by lowering the level um, distance listening perhaps, but looking at more functional characteristics of hearing loss so that we don't misrepresent how that child actually functions. Um, it includes some technology considerations, um, obviously the accommodations that we would recommend an intervention and some of those are um, laid out for each of the unilateral hearing loss or single-sided deafness. And um, all of the statements are supported with research. So I think it's a, a nice document if you're struggling at your school district level about um, supporting these students have um, these more, what we used to call minimal hearing losses. All right. So in closing, um, I think as audiologists, because we're that very first oftentimes um, point of contact that we've got to get it right. And so I, um, I just think that so much of this is about awareness for um, educators outside of deafness. And again, our kids act like they can hear and talk. So that's the perception and we don't always recognize the extra energy fatigue other things that go into having to perform up to that standard, um, as well as getting back into some of those identity self-esteem issues. So I'm going to end there. I hope that we have at least 10 minutes uh, for some questions. And um, Sarah, I'm, I'm not sure if this goes back to you to field questions, but I'm going to just wait and see what happens next. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Um, this was great. It really ha reminds me of so many children I met over the years and I'm so pleased that we're beginning to have recognition of their needs. Um, I'm just, uh, we're going to wait a couple of moments just in case there are some questions. Remember to put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll, if, if you don't mind, Cheryl, for a moment, uh, we'll see what comes up. While you're doing that, I think I have one more slide if anybody is interested. Um, the Carla, the audiologist, or the speech language pathologist that I worked with, um, we published an article um, in the Educational Audiology Journal. It's not called that anymore, but I can never remember the new name. There it is, Journal of Educational Pediatric and Rehabilitative Audiology. So if anybody um, what is interested, you can download the article. I do have two. Sorry about that. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I feel like I'm back in disco days. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple of questions, Cheryl, and um, I'll send this out with my um, sharing email uh, that I send out uh, once a month. The um, I'm having to move a little bit so I can see the writing on the. But Actually, I can, I can see it. Regarding um, the technology issues, do you have any advice regarding Roger Focus versus uh, a cross situation? Uh, there actually will be. I can't probably say too much because I just reviewed the article and it's, you're not supposed to share everything coming out of a review. But um, there was a paper written as a result of Phonax 
excuse me, unilateral hearing loss conference um, last year. And there are some specific recommendations for when you would use cross and focus um, from that conference that the kind of consensus panel that was brought together included. So watch for an article. Um, I would hope in the next couple of months, it'll be in the International Journal of Audiology and um, it has a whole crew, but um, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name at Vanderbilt is the lead, um, lead author. But anyway, um, my perception is that it's pretty individualized. Um, the, obviously the advantages of the Roger focus is that you're getting that DM signal so it's coming right into the ear whereas with the cross device it's not. Um, so I think I'm always been a proponent of some trial periods because sometimes we don't know how students respond um, and if there's a, a way to sort of do a baseline assessment let the student try a device for you know, maybe three weeks or so, and then go to a, another device after that. I know that's hard with a cross device because you probably don't have loaners that could be um, used. But um, I think, you know, it depends on what their processing is when there's a lot of background noise and how great the need is for that um, uh, direct input that Focus provides. I don't know if I answered your question Thank very you. well. Um, another question, and this is from a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. What would I request for an audiologist regarding further testing? What tests, I assume you're asking what tests would you want them to perform? Um, oh, here, I see the rest of it now. I think any audiology assessment has to include measures that would reflect how children hear in their customary environment of the classroom. Whether you do a functional listening evaluation, whether you do in the sound booth um, testing in noise, you know, to try and simulate what's going on in the classroom. You can do testing, speech discrimination testing in noise. You can do um, testing at a, a softer um, listening level. Again, for these children, until the listening environment because, becomes complex, we often don't see them break down. And Kevin was a good example. And um, that's because they have good hearing in one ear. But I think, and the problem is if you isolate and test the good ear, you're going to get pretty decent results. So you have to test them, you know, kind of in sound field to get the impact of how they would listen in a regular classroom. Um, there are other tools. Karen Anderson has a lot of great tools on her website um, that can help get at sort of how kids function. I love the classroom listening, uh, classroom um, communication, the CPQ, classroom participation questionnaire, because it gets input directly from the student about how they feel they're able to participate in the classroom. Um, you can download that from my website. You can download the functional listening evaluation from my website. I don't know if it's, I don't know if I put that on one of the slides, but I can certainly add it up real quick. Um, so I would request assessments that get at how children perform in the classroom, so more functionally based assessments. I'll send out your um, website information as well. Okay, great. Um, one more question. Um, Actually, a couple more questions. Uh, this from uh, an audiologist, an educational audiologist who works with dispensing audiologists. I'm finding one of my challenges with MMUSSD, I'm not sure how I'm going to pronounce that, is the lack of recommendation of assistive technology equipment outside of a hearing aid, uh, DM equipment, for example, from the initial diagnosing audiologist. It would, it then becomes more of an uphill battle as a new team member to get buy-in for the kids to get the, this equipment for school use. I guess the, it, we're looking at how can we um, bridge diagnosing audiologists to make those recommendations for um, technology. 
that's, I think, part of the awareness that we have to build is to help the diagnosing audiologist recognize in cases like this and the many other ones that we're all aware of that um, it has a significant impact. And because the diagnosing audiologist is that first point of contact, we want to get it right. So conversations that you can have with them, um, this document that um, is a very simple document to, to review that the Educational Audiology Association has on MUSD, uh, minimal mild unilateral single-sided deafness. Um, the article that's going to come out from the PHONAT conference in the International Journal of Audiology um, provides some uh, rec uh, recommendations. It has a huge research agenda. Um, the PHONAC conference proceedings are also available online at, on the PHONAC website and all of those um, articles would be good um, support for making sure that we're looking at all kids regardless of level of hearing loss thoroughly and really recognize that um, you know our assessment protocols minimally have to include listening in noise and, and really um, I think soft and with and without visual cues, all of those things. And we have to look at context too. We have to make the, the um, diagnostic procedure difficult enough that we force the child to break down if they're going to break down. If they do well, then, you know, that's another issue. I think the idea of processing time is really important. And that's not something that comes really through in an audiological assessment. Um, so maybe figuring out a way that, um, you know, we can kind of get at, get at that in our testing also. But I think just conversations, you know, a way to share information about what the research is showing and, and somehow capitalize on something that happens as an opportunity to, to go back and say, is the protocol we're using for children sufficient? And is there other things that we can do to improve on it? Because I understand in your system that diagnosing audiologist does include um, FMDM. In the US, that would be a school decision. So um, the dispensing audiologist or diagnosing audiologist doesn't have as big a role in the assistive listening devices that are used. A different landscape here. <laughs> and the final question was maybe related to what your website would be so that we, um, it was related to the classroom participation questionnaire, your CPQ. Mm -hmm. um, what is your website? Maybe you can just give it to us verbally so people can look that up. Yeah, just um, www.advantage.com. And it's ADE Vantage, like here, Audiology Deaf Education Vantage. Great. And you can navigate to a section. I think that that's programs. it. Wonderfully on time. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, Cheryl, for bringing this. I think uh, the conversation will continue um, in, in our little cohorts all over the province. Um, we had great... Um, number of people joining us today and um, I want to thank Jeff for doing the captioning and Tracy for doing the sign uh, language interpretation and this is just a reminder that the next PLC is December 13th from noon to 1 and this is with a, a Q&A with uh, CID regarding SPICE and the SPICE for Life kit so um, I appreciate everybody's participation and this has been fabulous. Thank you. And thank you to the interpreter. I um, talked a little too fast at the beginning and I realized that I needed to slow down. So I apologize for getting off to probably a little rough start for you, but you were great.